Well, hello and welcome back to Principles of Accounting 2. I'm your host, Dr. B. And today we're going to be talking about uh, the master budget and planning. Before we jump into today's conversation on the master budget and planning, I do want to quickly discuss a couple housekeeping items where we are, where we're going, uh, and what's happening with the final exam. So, uh, we're, we're here in the classroom. When you come down to, through course content, uh, we are now um, in Module 3. Uh, if you could believe it or not, yeah, Module 3. Yeah, oh yeah, we're halfway done with the course, by the way. Um, the midterm exam was back in Week 4, uh, which you all took care of that on uh, this past Sunday. I'll, I'll say this, uh, the majority of the students in this class did very well on the midterm exam. So you should be proud of, uh, of your accomplishment there. Uh, as you recall, the midterm exam was worth 20% of your total grade. So uh, if, if you did very well, awesome. That's great, you know, you're, you're in good shape. If you didn't do as well as you had hoped you would, the good news is you'll have another opportunity with the final. Uh, so, um, the final exam also is 20% of the grade. So, having said that, if you didn't do as well as you had hoped on the midterm, you want to really take a look at these next three weeks uh, in, in closer detail. And I also recommend that you take your time, you know, start it early, save your work, take your time. It's all open book, open note. So there's really no reason why you shouldn't do well. Um, and I'll also say that uh, on the final exam, the last I checked, there's not really uh, much math involved. It's, it's more uh, knowing the formula, the formulas, I should say. And it's more knowing the, the terms and definitions. As long as you focus uh, over these next three weeks, week five, six, and seven, I promise you'll do very well. Uh, so, so with that, I do also want to discuss what's going on this week. Uh, we're about to bunch it, jump into Chapter 22, which is the Master Budget and uh, Planning Process. There's a Chapter 22 homework assignment. Very similar format to your previous homework assignments. And then we will jump into chapter 23, which is more budgeting. And there's a quiz with that, with that, um, for, for that assignment. So you have two tasks to complete for Sunday night. Uh, and as always, you have two attempts on all homework assignments and all quizzes. Two attempts on all homework assignments and all quizzes. So what that means is don't do so hot the first time around, you can try again. <laughs> yeah, so please take advantage of those opportunities. Uh, I, I promise um, they'll be helpful. And uh, you can also go back and review your work. So after you've made a submission, you can actually cl click on that grade in the grade book, and you can actually view your submission. And the nice thing with doing that is it allows you to kind of review those questions again. Um, so as you're studying for the final exam, in addition to the lectures that you're attending and the PowerPoints and the homework assignments and quizzes, go back through the homework assignments and quizzes and, and take a look at the questions and just kind of like refresh yourself. Um, I, I think that'll help because you, it, um, the questions will be similar on, on the uh, final exam. So that's what I'll say about that. And then um, I have not yet put in the the exercises. I'll do that today. Uh, so so this afternoon you'll see an another area here for week five. It'll say exercises, uh, just like I've done before, right? Uh, just kind of to help you practice, especially with budgeting is very important. So with that, let's go ahead and jump into uh, our discussion today on the master budget and planning. And as I started our conversation, I had said that every company has a budget. Every company has a plan. Uh, 
why does every company have a budget? And that is the question that I want to help you to answer. Uh, because some of you have expressed to me and to your, your classmates that you currently own a business or you're currently looking to start a business or you're working for a small business and maybe they don't have a budget. Uh, so we'll talk about why we have budgets, what's the importance behind it, how do we form a budget, uh, and what, is it, what does it mean in the long run. So we're going to talk, we're going to talk about all, all about those, uh, those aspects of budgeting. And I'll also talk about why it's important to compare your actual performance to the budget. So first, let's talk about uh, the process and the benefits. Uh, so what you see here, these six elements, if you will, these are managerial functions. These six components, sometimes seven, but mostly six, they call these the uh, management functions. This is what management does. This is what it means to manage. These are what these are things that managers do. Uh, and it all starts with um, it all starts with really uh, coordination, in my opinion. You know, I mean, we see, or, uh, yeah, coordination problem. And you see it's a circle, right? It goes around and round and round and round, and it never stops. It's, a, it's an iterative, what we call an iterative process. It means we keep doing it, we keep improving on it, we keep doing it, we keep improving on it. It's an iterative, iterative process. And it all starts with talking uh, and, and coordinating. So coordination. We get everyone together and have a meeting about the company's goals. Now, uh, I'm gonna, as I talk about this, uh, for those of you who are hospitality majors, you'll probably like this uh, part uh, because I'm going to give you some real-life experience examples that I've had in the past. So for those of you who remember, I was a financial controller of Radisson Hotels in New York State. And our largest hotel, we had a lot of um, different departments. You know, hot hotels have different departments. You got, you got front office, that's, they take care of the front desk and other administrative duties at the front office. That also includes night auditing, et cetera. Housekeeping, night auditing. Yep. So housekeeping. Manager, assistant manager. You got it. Exactly. That's front office. So in addition to the front office, uh, you have uh, rooms division. The rooms division, takes, uh, they are involved with housekeeping. Uh, they're involved with everything that coordinates with the guest folio. Okay. So housekeeping, uh, room service, making sure the charges are accurate, et cetera, et cetera. They all, rooms division also is in charge of the laundry service, the laundry department, um, and all of that, all of everything that encompasses rooms, right? And so you have rooms division, you got front office, then you have the sales department. The sales department is responsible for getting additional customer guests uh, to, to book, uh, you know, except weddings, um, uh, conferences, you name it, right? The list goes on. Uh, and, you know, they're responsible for getting the contracts for, for airline uh, guests that work for the airlines, etc. So you got, you got the rooms division, you got the sales department, you got front office, and then you, you got um, food and beverage department that, it, that they're in control of all food and beverage operations at the hotel. That, that could range from weddings to conferences to the restaurant to um, you know, uh, room service, etc. Everything involved with 
food and beverage. And then you got um, the administrative uh, departments, human resources, accounting, uh, you know, those are the support functions. You got all these different departments at the hotel, okay? You got to get them all together, coordinate them, all the managers or, or managers, directors. You get them all into a meeting. And we talk about the company's goals. And that was one thing that I helped to do at the hotel was to get all the different managers together, sit them all down, and we start talking, what are your goals for this coming fiscal year? Okay. And, and we would talk about our goals like, okay, like, like for example, the engineering department. They, they're responsible for the maintenance of the hotel. All right, engineering, uh, what's, your, what's your goals for uh, this coming fiscal year? Oh, we want to upgrade... Um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. We want to, we want to do whatever repairs, whatever maintenance, paint the walls, whatever. Yeah. So that's their goal for that department. Uh, for the sales department, the goal is to increase sales by some percentage. Great. For the um, front office, their goal would be to uh, increase guest satisfaction by some percentage. But you see that each department has their own goals. So we get all of our managers together at the hotel and we say, okay, well, write down your goals. What do you want to accomplish this coming fiscal year? So for step one is coordination. Get all of the, all the managers, all the stakeholders involved in that discussion. The next step in the management cycle is communication. This is where the entire management staff, the directors, the managers for all the different departments, the hotel, they get together and they talk about the plan. What is the plan? How are we going to uh, plan these goals that we established in the coordination phase? Uh, throughout the entire organization. Professor, is that the same as when they have a meeting with the board? It's similar. So, so the so there's two different types of um, stakeholders. You have a board of directors. The board of directors, uh, they're more on the top top level oversight. Um, you know, they're responsible for appointing the. Um, president, the general manager, etc. Uh, so that's a little different. They're, they're, they're more top level stuff. They're more concerned with policy and, and um, operating procedure, etc. So they're more administrative. This is more uh, what we're talking about here, Marina, is more like the, the frontline managers, the managers that are directly responsible for each department. So it's more it's more like hands on, whereas the board of directors is more administrative, top level stuff. So to, I hope that helps to clarify it for you. Okay. Uh, although although it is true that uh, board of directors do have these types of meetings as well, it's it's more on the administrative side of things. This is more like the the actual front line. Uh, uh, working hands-on type of type of management. So, so the management uh, when they plan for the organization uh, collectively, they bring all their goals together. Then we move into the coordination. Okay, so how does each department get the, all of their employees on the same page to work together toward these? goals for each department. Basically, management is disseminating the um, goals that they have set forth to all of their employees and saying, hey, okay, this is what we need to do to meet our goals. And then comes the motivation. Management for each department helps to establish the budget 
based off of their goals that are attainable. What do I mean by that? So at the hotel, if the sales department's goal is to increase sales by 10%, which is attainable, what do we need in order to attain that goal? Where do we need to spend money and what areas to attain that goal? Okay. So this is where we're putting our exactly marketing uh, is, is a great example of that. You know, the sales department uses their marketing budget to uh, increase sales. They might also um, do some additional things that salespeople do. I don't know. I, you know, I'm not a sales guy. I'm just an accountant. So, but yeah, that's a good point. And so, but they would establish, they would, they would actualize their goals by putting it in the budget. So, for example, in the engineering department, they're responsible for the maintenance of the hotel. If they say, hey, you know, our goal is to update 100 rooms this coming fiscal year. Okay, so in the budget, we would see uh, increased expense uh, budgets for um, supplies, right? F uh, furniture, supplies, uh, paint, um, whatever. So that that's, helps to actualize their goals. So, and I can keep going, you know, but the, the, that's how, that's how we motivate is we, we look at the goals, management looks at their goals and they say, okay, let me put this in a budget to help me to attain those goals. And then we move from the motivation to the plan. Now we're executing the, the, the budget. We're executing our goals. Okay. How do we, we're actualizing it. We, we, Managements, they all got together. They submitted their individual budgets for their departments. We put it all together collectively in this, this thing called a master budget, which we're about to talk about. And then we start executing. You know, the, the fiscal year starts. Okay, boom, boom, boom. The months start flying by, just like they do. Now, as each month is going by in your new budgeted year, we, we we're, we're executing, we're planning it, we're executing it. Then we go into the control phase of management. This is where we look at what we budgeted and we compare it to our actual performance in each month. So if I say, oh, in my budget, uh, let's, what month are we in? We're November. So in my budget for this month, if my goal was to increase my sales by 3%, we'll say. And I finished the month, my sales ended up being 2%. Then I go, I, I, I'm comparing those in the control phase. I'm saying, oh, my goal was 3%. I came in at 2%. Here's what happened. Here's why it happened. And then... I take that information and it helps me to go back through the process again for the next fiscal year. That's why it's, that's why it keeps going. It's an iterative process. That's why budgeting happens every year. So this is, these are the six managerial um, things, <laughs> stages, whatever you want to call them, that we go through each year in order to establish a budget. And really, we, the whole organization benefits from the budgeting process. That's really what this, what, what the whole story that I was trying to get at. And with that budget, we can continue to improve year after year. And a lot of this has to do with this thing called human behavior. <laughs> uh, there is um, there's a radio personality that I like. Uh, his name is Dave Ramsey, and he is a um, personal finance type of guy. Uh, interesting, interesting background. Um, 
you know, a lot of people call into this radio show that he has and they complain about things that are going on in their lives and they, and then they, they, it all comes back down to human behavior, right? There's this thing that that people say is that um, money or is 80% behavioral and 20% technical. Okay. It's 80% behavior 20% 20% technical. That's so true. The reason why is because as humans, money has an influence. Okay? And we, as humans, act on this thing called emotion. So, for example, remember that one day when you were all upset And you decided, you know what will make me feel better is if I go get myself a Louis Vuitton handbag. Was that a wise decision? (laughs) It made you feel good for a couple minutes, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah, uh, Pavle, his name is Dave Ramsey. Dave Ramsey. That's the name of the show. But uh, Kovac, I I know you know what I'm saying. (laughs) <laughs> sometimes we spend money as humans to make us feel good. That's, that's called acting on emotion. Uh, so budgeting is the same way. Okay. We budget based off of logic, but our budget is influenced by human emotion. I have a budget for every month. I have a personal budget and I have a business budget. My personal budget is I have a mortgage that uh, is the same every month. I put that in my budget. Okay. I have utility bills like electric and I have an estimate of what my electric will be each month. I know that it's going to be different each month, but I estimate it. Uh, I know what my income is because I'm on salary. It's the same amount uh, each paycheck, twice a month. So I know what that is. So I know what my income is, and I have an idea of what my expenses are going to be. Um, so when I, that's how I budget. That's how most people budget for their household. Oh, I have a, I have a family of you know four or whatever. So. This is what I expect to spend on groceries each month. Um, I travel to my job with my car. My car payment is X. I expect to spend so much in fuel. Uh, and uh, this is what my insurance is. You, can, you see how we can budget everything. Logically, it makes sense. Logically, it makes sense. The challenges are attaining the goals, right? I have my budget, but I'm also human. Okay. So if I have a couple of bad days, I might say, you know what? I really, uh, you know, when I'm at the grocery store and I'm having a rough, a rough week, I see that Ben and Jerry's over there, uh, in that nice fancy freezer. I'm like, you know, I, I like Ben and Jerry's. That'll make me feel good for a little bit. Until I, you know, look in the mirror and realize I ate a whole pint in one sitting. But you see what I'm saying? It's it's an emotional reaction. So human behavior has a significant impact on, on budgeting. Most people don't budget, which is bad, by the way. If you don't have a budget, you need a, you need a, a budget. Okay. Why? Because if you spend more than you have coming in, you're going to go in debt. That's right. I mean, that's kind of how it works. If you're spending more than what's coming in, you're going to go in debt. We don't want you to go in debt. Debt is bad. Okay. Debt is a bad thing. So don't go in debt. (laughs) How do you not go in debt? You have a budget. Your budget is your plan. Your plan is what you stick to. And so that's, that's what I'm saying about this. It's, it's a, it's a human process. I mean, we, we all have, we all have our, our um, influences, and sometimes we go over budget. 
or we go under budget or whatever. But the budget should be a positive motivating force. How is that uh, the case in business? It motivates employees to attain their goals. If you have a sales budget to increase your sales by 10% year over year, that's your goal. It's, it excites you. You say, oh, yeah, I could do that. Oh, here's how I'll do that. I'll spend some more on marketing. I'll, I'll um, attract more customers by doing some social media things and whatever, whatever. And that's how you do it. It's, that, so that, that's your goal, increase sales by 10%. It's visual. The budget is published, so you can see it. You know what you, you, know what you need to do, so it motivates you, right? Uh, and we can evaluate our performance to our goal, to our budget. And so that's a positive motivating factor. But of course, there's some negative things that come out of budgeting. Uh, employees understate or overstate their sales uh, goals to allow for additional expenses. Yeah, that's a, that can be a problematic. Uh, there's additional pressures that are on us and might cause some unethical behavior. Uh, employees might purchase unnecessary items to try to meet their goal. It's like I, I've seen some crazy things, especially the hotel. Oh my! Oh my goal is to uh, increase my guest satisfaction score. The stars report, right? Uh, my guest, my guest satisfaction score at the hotel. I, I need to increase that. My star, to, so my stars report comes out good. Well, how do I do that? Well, I'm going to buy some extra goodies for my guests when they come in. That's going to blow your budget. Okay, <laughs> so you know there's certain. Uh, Expenditures that don't necessarily need to be there. But these are all things that are influenced by human behavior. So, and that kind of leads us into our the next part of our conversation is when we're budgeting, there's a time component, obviously. When we build a budget, we do it for 12 months. We do it for a full 12-month cycle. Okay, uh, That's called an annual budget or a uh, fiscal year budget. It's based off of the fiscal year of the company. Uh, you can do that personally, too. You could say you could plan your whole year out for your budget and then compare month to month uh, based off of the actual performance to what you budgeted for. The same concept applies in business. So we budget out for a year, calendar year, okay? Uh, or, or a fiscal year. And we talked a little bit about this earlier on, didn't we? We, we, we said... We said it's important for a business to plan 12 months out into the future. The reason why that's so important is I need to understand uh, how November 2021 is going to impact November 2022. Why is that important? If I experienced a sales decline... In November 2021, is that a key indicator that I will have a sales decline in November 2022? Okay, Th those types of things help to plan out into the future. So that's why in business we operate on a on a 12 month cycle. Okay, we we plan 12 months into the future, whatever that looks like, and. Uh, it's a, it's on a rolling basis. So when November 2021 finishes here in the next two weeks, I will then budget for November 2022. When November when December 2021 is finished, I'll budget for December 2022. When January 2022 is finished, I'll budget for January 2023 so forth and so on. It's a rolling 12 months. It's called a rolling budget. And the reason why we do that is because uh, what happens in the current month will impact what will happen 12 months from now, right? And so that's why it's important to have, be on a rolling budget. The other nice thing with that is you can always make adjustments <laughs> right, in, in the future. So that's that's basically what this what this slide shows us. But in practicality, it makes perfect sense because 
uh, it's we call it a dynamic budget. It, dynamic simply means we can make modifications to it. Uh, and with a dynamic budget, I can modify it month to month as I'm planning 12 months out. Then what happens is, as each month goes by, I compare what actually happened to my budget. It's like, oh, I, uh, I'm, I'm spot on with the rent. I'm spot on with um, uh, my revenue. I'm spot on with most of my expenses. My electric's a little high. So I'm on the electric line item, you're going to be a little uh, over budget. But then it'll probably even out over the months, right? It might be lower one month, higher one month, lower one month, um, so forth and so on. But if you look at the full twelve months, it balances out. Hopefully, and we'll talk. We'll talk about how that. But but the idea behind it is, we're continuously budgeting twelve months into the future. Every time we establish a budget, uh, and the the simple reason is the. Um, as I had said earlier, the current month will help me to understand what might happen in 12 months from now. And so I can make adjustments for that future 12 months from now. So as we're establishing this budget, we're looking at all the different departments, right? So I gave the example of the hotel. When I was working in the hotel, we had a lot of different departments. We had front, of, we had a front office, we had rooms division, we had food and beverage, sales, support offices, etc. Each department had their own budget. Okay, I would go around to all the managers of each department and say, "Hey, listen." Uh, I need you to tell me how much you plan on spending in the next fiscal year. What's your budget for the next fiscal year? So they would give me an idea of what they plan to spend uh, for the next 12 months, next fiscal year. Then I would, the last people I would go to is the sales department. Say, all right, well, technically I had to go to the sales department first, but so I go to the sales department and I say, okay, sales department, how much revenue are y'all going to be bringing in over the next, well, uh, over the next fiscal year? What are your sales expected to be? And that's where we would start. So the first part of the budgeting process is not so much looking at all the various expenses because we know that some of those ex expenses are fixed. But really, we start with the sales department. And here's why. With the sales, that's your revenue, right? So think of your, your income statement. You got sales, you got expenses. And then at the bottom, you got net income. Well, how... Are you going to know how much to budget for all your expenses if you don't have an idea of how much sales you're going to be bringing in? Right? It's real hard for me to say, oh, I think I'm going to have this much in direct materials, this much in direct labor, this much in factory overhead, if I don't know how much sales I'm going to be bringing in. How can you budget for direct materials if you don't know how many units you're going to sell? This, the same works for the hotel business, right? If if I don't if my room room uh, my my revenue per room my, or my uh, rev par, okay, if my rev par at the hotel, which is the revenue revenue per uh, overnight guest, right? If my revenue per overnight guest uh, is going to be if it's planned, meaning our sales department has a bunch of contracts and, and I know how many room nights I got booked for the fiscal year and how many room nights they plan to sell, then I can accurately budget for my materials, my labor, and factory overhead for the hotel, right? 
by materials, meaning, you know, the operational materials. Because we know hotels don't actually carry inventory. It's a service business. But we, but we do know that there are, are materials that we use. We also know we have labor to plan for. You know, how many labor hours for each department do I plan to use? And what about my fixed expenses under factory overhead? So, in other words, the sales budget, how much I plan to sell for the next fiscal year, is what is ultimately going to drive the rest of the budgeting process. Because if you don't know how much you're going to sell or plan to sell, you're not going to know how, how much you're going to need to allocate the, to the production or to, or to the other departments if it's a service business, right? Does that make sense? Why don't we start with the sales budget first? That totally makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, perfect. Exactly. And, and, and for those of you who are doing like a personal budget, you could even look at it this way. The sales, that's your, your income. You know, how much household income you got coming in. Same, you can apply the same concept really to your, your personal life if you wanted to. But uh, to just give, kind of give you that idea. But sales, how much, how much revenue the business plans on taking in based off of their projections. And, and the sales, sales projections are based off of sales contracts I already have, sales contracts I'm working on, previous year sales, um, uh, and, and what are the future plans for like marketing, et cetera. All of those things together help me to forecast my sales budget. The sales budget total is what drives my production budget. That's how many direct materials do I need to purchase? How many direct labor hours do I plan to have for the fiscal year? And what is going to be my factory overhead? And all of those together the, from the production ultimately tells me how much cash do I need? <laughs> if, I'm, if I need to buy direct materials and pay employees and pay rent and, and other things, how much cash do I need? So that helps to drive this thing called a cash budget which is a financial budget. It's a cash budget. Tells me exactly how much cash I need to use. And my sales budget, the thing we started with, also tells me my selling expenses, general administrative expenses. Why is that? Because I have salespeople I need to pay. I have uh, uh, marketing, advertising, uh, et cetera. The sales budget will drive the selling administrative expenses budget and it'll also drive the production budget. But it also drives this, this third thing called capital expenditures. And you all remember what capital expenditures are, right? Capital expenditures, that's the purchase of, or sale of property, plant, and equipment. And I guess maybe like extraordinary repairs. You all remember the story I told real early on. Remember the story I told you about the, the chiller at the hotel? When the chiller broke? You all remember that story? So the chiller broke at the hotel. And it was, we're talking millions of dollars, right? Uh, and they wanted um, some silly amount to fix it. And so then you have to go through that decision process. Do I fix it or do I buy a new one? And that comes, that, that part comes out of the capital expenditures budget. So that's why uh, we have capital expenditures. And it's based off of the sales because the sales revenue or net income I hope to obtain helps, helps to, to uh, tell me how much I should be putting into the capital expenditures budget to make the, to, to purchase property plan equipment or sell um, and extraordinary repairs, that type of thing. And all of that together drives this thing called a cash budget. So really we're looking at three different types of budgets. We're looking at operations, investing, and financing. 
your operations are basically budgets for your income statement and your balance sheet. Uh, your investing budget, balance sheet, but more statement of cash flows. And of course, your cash budget is all cash flow, statement of cash flows. But you see that really what we're doing here is we're creating budgets for our income statement, balance sheet, and statement of cash flows, ultimately. And I'll show you uh, how it all breaks down. Now, the example I'm going to use, and, and, you know, I talked about the hotel, which is, as you know, a service business. But the example I'm going to use is going to be a manufacturing company because we talk a lot, as you know, in this course, we talk a lot about direct materials, direct labor, factory overhead, which are, when you add all those three things together, that's the total cost of our, of our products, yeah? And so uh, I'm going to talk about the budget from that perspective. So as we talked about earlier, the first thing you need to do is establish your sales budget. The sales budget tells me how many units I expect to sell and how much revenue I expect to get from those sales. Makes sense, right? How many units I plan to sell, how much revenue I expect to get from those sales. Couple things that impact that are economic and market conditions uh, and capacity and the advertising plans. Those are the things that impact your sales budget. If the economy sucks, people ain't gonna wanna buy your stuff, right? I mean, they don't have the extra money. If the economy is good, then sure, they'll wanna spend money and buy your stuff. Uh, Pavle, for example, Pavle's got this business where he buys and sells cars, okay? If the economy tanks, they might not want to be buying money on, spending money on cars, okay? But if the market is good, people might need a second car for whatever reason, or maybe they're going to buy for their car for their kid who's learning how to drive or whatever. So the economy and the market, you know, they, of course those things will impact your sales budget because they kind of dictate if you're going to be able to sell. The other things that impact your sales budget are what's your capacity and uh, what do you plan, how do you plan to sell your stuff? Advertising? Are you going to do some advertising? Are you going to do some social media? Are you going to do some whatever, whatever? Well, all those things cost money, right? So the sales budget drives those things, but it also relies on that type of information. So how do we estimate our sales budget? We take the estimated number of units we plan to sell times the unit price or estimated unit price, what, what do you plan to sell it for? A lot of this goes back to what we talked about. Remember the conversation we had about break even, you know, cost volume, profit analysis, CVP, break even. A lot of that has to go, it, uh, it builds on that concept. Those concepts we learned about break even. Estimated number of units we expect to sell times this estimated sales price. Number of units times sales price. Number of units times sales price. These are estimates because they're in the future. We actually don't know if we're going to sell all those or not, but they're in the future, and we have an estimated price of what we're going to sell for. So number of units times the sales price gives me my sales budget. Now here's a nice uh, example. We got a company. Uh, apparently, we sell sticks, and I really I still don't quite know what they are, but apparently, they're expensive, they're like 60 bucks a piece. So, uh, oh, hockey sticks. Okay, got it. It's Toronto. That makes sense. <laughs> okay, so we got this company in Toronto. 
Canada. They manufacture hockey sticks. I'm not, hockey's okay. It's an interesting sport. So, okay, so they, they manufacture hockey sticks. It's, uh, and they, they, um, they sell hockey sticks for $60 a piece. It's Toronto. That makes sense. So in September 2019, they sold 700 hockey sticks at $60 a piece. Okay, great. So what does that tell us? I'm breaking out my calculator now. So 700 units times 60 bucks a piece, that's $42,000 that they sold in the month of September. They budgeted out their sales for each month of the year. Okay. In the month of October, they expect to sell a thousand hockey sticks, $60 a unit. That's that's $60,000 of budgeted sales. November, they expect to sell 800 units at $60 a unit. It's $48,000 in sales. December, $84,000 in sales. 1,400 units times 60. All together for the three months, October, November, December, months that haven't happened yet for this company. It's $3,200 uh, 3, units they expect to sell total. At $60 per unit, that's $192,000 of expected sales revenue from October to December of 2019. But you see how that works. And and the way and in practice and real life, we plan a full 12 months into the future using the rolling budget. So here I am, November 2021. I already know what my uh, my my, my uh, budget is from December 2021 all the way to no, um, to October 2022. Okay, that's a full 12 month cycle. When I do my budget for November 2022, 12 months from now, after this month finishes, I will take the sales I've made. For November 2021 to estimate the number of sales I'll make for November 2022. It's always good to use historical data when you're projecting into the future. If you don't have historical data, let's say Pavle, for example, he's got a new business selling and selling and buying and selling cars. It's a pretty new business. So Pavle he probably doesn't have historical data if it's a brand new business, right? So he might say, well, uh, last month I sold three cars, okay? So far this month I sold one. So he's thinking to himself, how can I estimate the number of cars I expect to sell next month if I don't have the previous year's data? You can look at your trends and say, okay, I think I'm going to sell four cars next month. Let's see, let's say you're ambitious and you got a couple of good deals lined up. Four cars next month. Great. So you can estimate the sales price for each car, uh, sales price for each car times the number of units you expect to sell to get your budget for the sales for the next month. And that's how, that's how it works. And we go 12 months in the future. Uh, it's, there's not really an exact science behind the... <clears throat> Sorry, Professor. But what if I have like some additional uh, expense? Like, for example, I'm planning for next month to, set, to, to sell four cars. But then I bought these four cars and one car needs to repair something that I didn't know. Yeah. What's like, what should I do in that solution? Great question. Uh, which is going to bring us uh, to our, our next part of the budget, right? Which is, which is going to be um, our production budget is where ultimately that would fall into because there's a cost 
to getting the, the car, right? We call that the cost of goods sold. So you're going to estimate your cost of goods sold based off of the production budget. So if there is, a, as you said, an, an unexpected expense that arises with um, the sale of this particular car, two things need to happen. Number one is ultimately you would want to adjust your sales price to reflect the increase based off of that repair. If that's not possible, then you would need to simply add that expense into your projected expenses for next month. And I'll, I'll show you what that looks like. But great question. Absolutely. And this is what exactly what we're about to talk about. So the production budget. So after you got your sales budget, the next step, logically, is to, to plan for those sales. Well, how do you do that? We budget for the amount of direct materials, the amount of direct labor, and the amount of factory overhead that we need for each unit that we expect to produce. We call this the production budget. So as you know, in manufacturing, we have direct materials, direct labor, factory overhead. Those three things need to be budgeted to get a units to produce budget. Uh, and here's how it works. We have, if the business is already up and running, which hopefully it is, you'll have ending inventory from the previous month. Uh, or from the previous year. Plus, you'll add in the uh, number of units you expect to sell for this year or month. You'll subtract out the units you already have available for sale, and that will tell you the number of units you need to make for that year to meet your sales goal. Go ahead, David. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, David. Can, can you speak directly into your mic? I can't hear you. I'm sorry, David. I, I, can't, I can't hear you. I'm, 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 David. David, I'm, I'm sorry, my friend. I, I, you, uh, yeah, I, I'm sorry, David. I can't hear you. He's talking to someone else. And oh, is he? Okay. David, mute yourself. Okay, I'll mute him. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I couldn't tell what was what was happening there. Okay. Um, so the number of units you need to produce, meaning the ones you need to make, you figure out that by taking your uh, ending inventory that you, uh, that you want to have in the future. Okay. Plus your uh, units that you expect to sell for the year minus your beginning inventory. The beginning inventory is what you're going to start the year with. Uh, and that will uh, give you the number of units you need to produce. It's also important to, sh uh, to understand this part. The production budget doesn't always show costs. It's expressed in a number of units you need to produce. Uh, because the cost of direct materials, direct labor, and to some degree factory overhead, change over time. Uh, if, as, those ch as those costs change, we know that um, 
the cost will change with it, right? The total cost per, of each unit will change with it. So we express these in units, not necessarily dollars. So how many units do I need to produce? Let's go back to our uh, hockey stick business and take a look at the production budget. And what this does is it tells me, it gives me an estimate of how many hockey sticks I need to make each month in order to meet my sales goals. So the, the budgeted sales goals is what drives right, the number of units you need to produce. Just like we talked about, everything starts with the sales. And then we can budget for production. So we have our sales budget. For October, it's 800, 800 units is what I expect to sell for the month of October. Uh, 90% of those units are going to be future sales inventory that I need for future sales so 90% is what I uh, expect to have in the next sales budget so 800 times 90% is 720 800 times 90% is 720 720 units is is what I'm going to end the month of October with. So if I end the month of October with 720 units, that means that I uh, would need a thousand units addition thousand units additional plus my ending inventory 720 is a thousand seven twenty available to produce now here's the term available to produce this is the number of units that I can make that's my what we call my capacity how many units I can make that's my capacity. So 1,720 units is my capacity to produce. And I started the previous month, or I started the month with 1,010 units available. So that means I only need to make 710 units. So I have 1,720 units capacity to make for the month of October. I already have in my inventory 1,010. So I take my capacity, 1,720, minus 1,010 units to give me the number of units I need to produce in order to meet my sales goal for the month of October. So if I expect to sell 800 units, I want to end the month with 720. Uh, I plan to make a thousand units. My total capacity is 1,720. I already have 1,010 units on hand. That means I only need to make 710. And then how do I plan for the next month? The next month, I have my budget, 1,400 units I expect to sell. 90% of that's 1,260. Uh, I'm adding in 800 units. My total capacity is 2,060. Minus my beginning inventory from the previous month, 720. Tells me I need to manufacture 1,340 hockey sticks from the month of November. And then it moves forward to the next month. How do I plan for the next month? I take the desired ending inventory from November, use that for the beginning of the inventory for December. Plan to sell 900 units. 
ninety percent, eight hundred and ten uh, ending inventory, fourteen hundred units added in. I uh, have available two thousand two hundred ten units. I am going to end the month with one thousand two hundred sixty units. That means I that means I need to make nine hundred and fifty units, and so forth and so on. And it goes on like that. It continues. So from that, from the number of units that I expect to manufacture, I can now plan for direct materials, direct labor factory overhead. Because remember, the total cost of a unit is the direct material, direct labor factory overhead. So now I know how many units I need to make in each month. I can now plan for the amount of direct materials or amount of direct labor and the amount of factory overhead for each unit, which will give me the budgeted uh, manufacturing uh, for, the, for the year, right? So let's take a look at the, uh, the direct materials budget. As you know, direct materials is what is used uh, to manufacture a finished good. That's the raw materials. It, in this case, since we're making hockey sticks, it's mostly wood, right? So how much wood do I need to buy? <laughs> uh, wood, sometimes, uh, probably in Canada. When you buy in bulk, it's measured in pounds, not necessarily in sticks and in, in uh, quantity. Measured in pounds. So pounds of wood. How much wood do I need? So I, month of October, I, I expect to make 710 units. I, of the 710 units, I need half or 50%, 0. 0.5 uh, materials to make 710 units. So, uh, here we are. Let's see. I need uh, 355 pounds of wood based off of the number of units I expect to sell. Or I expect, I'm sorry, I expect to make for the month of October. So, I expect to make 710 units. I need 355 pounds of wood. I'm going to purchase additional pounds of wood for next month, 335 pounds in this case. So that means I'm going to total, uh, I'm going to need a, a total amount of 690 pounds of wood. Now I started the month of October with 178 pounds. So that means I only need to purchase for the month of October 512 pounds of wood. The materials cost is $20 per pound of wood. $20 per pound of wood times the number of units I need to purchase, 512, gets me $10,240 of materials cost for the month of October. Okay. And then it repeats itself. You know, November, December, I do the same exact process. Number of units I plan to produce, times some materials requirement per unit, gets me the total amount of wood I need in production, plus what I need to end the month with, equals total materials cost, minus what I began the month with equals the amount of uh, raw materials I need to purchase. We take the raw materials purchase price times the amount you need to purchase equals the total cost of direct materials purchases for that month. Make sense? It's pretty straightforward, right? Y'all there? Y'all awake? 
Yeah, it makes sense, Professor. Yes, Professor. Awesome. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a process, just like anything else. So you got your sales budget. That's what we started with. The sales budget told me how many units I need to manufacture to meet my sales goal. From that, I found how much units I need to produce each month and how much direct materials I need for each month. Now I do this a, a similar process for the labor. The labor, as you recall, are, are these are the employees that are manufacturing the actual products. In our example, hockey sticks. So these employees are on the assembly line, the, the wood cutting department, the assembly department, etc. They're putting together the hockey sticks. Maybe a paint department, I don't know. But there's employees that do these things. And I need to budget labor hours for each month. And it's based on the number of units I expect to manufacture each month. So in the month of October, I expect to manufacture 710 units. It takes me 25 minutes, 0.25 hours, per hockey stick to make a, one hockey stick. So if I'm going to make 710 hockey sticks, it takes me 25 minutes to make each hockey stick on average. That tells me I will need a total amount of hours of 177.5 hours for the month of October to make a 710 hockey sticks. So I took the number of units I expect to make times the amount of time it takes to make each unit equals the amount of hours needed to make the total amount of units for that month. So in other words, in this example, I have a, I'm going to make a 710 units. It takes 25 minutes for each unit. So 710 times 25 minutes equals 177.5 hours. 177.5 hours times the labor rate. Labor rate is per hour. So 177.5 times $12 per hour, that's how much my employees make in this process, equals a total labor cost for the month of October, 2,130. And I do that for each month. And that will give me my labor budget uh, for those three months. So we, So let's recap. First, I got my sales budget. The sales budget told me how many units I need to make. Figured out how many units I need to make. Uh, it, that told me the amount of raw materials I needed. Then it told me how many hours I need to make all those units. And now it's going to tell me how much factory overhead do I need to budget for each unit. So here we go. Factory overhead, as you know, in includes the indirect stuff. The supervisor salaries, the rent, the, uh, the um, electricity, etc. So we budget based off of the number of units we expect to produce. October, I expect to make 710 units. I have what we call a variable factory overhead rate. I'm sure you all remember that conversation from two weeks ago. Overhead, as you know, can be allocated in a couple of different ways. We got the single plant-wide rate method. You got the um, activity-based cost method. You got the uh, uh, double plant-wide rate method, etc. So we figure out our overhead rate. 
In this case, we're using the variable factory overhead rate. This is the amount of overhead applied to each unit, $2.50. So if I'm going to make 710 units in October times $2.50 for each unit of overhead, that gives me $1,775 uh, uh, of variable factory overhead. Well, uh, we all know that there's also fixed costs. So I got my variable cost plus my fixed overhead for the month of October, 1500 equals my total factory overhead budget for the month of October, 3275 So that's my variable cost plus my fixed cost. Gives me my total cost. We see, and it's very important to note, the fixed overhead does not change. Regardless of the level of output, it's fixed. The salaries, the rent, those things don't change over time. I still got to pay them regardless of how many units I produce. That's why it's fixed. It stays the same each month. $1,500 per month is my fixed overhead. The thing that does change is my variable factory overhead. You take the number of units you expect to produce times... The factory overhead rate per unit equals the variable factory overhead for that month. So, well, let's put it all together. Direct materials, direct labor, factory overhead, all of those things are budgeted based on the number of units I expect to produce. And the number of units I expect to produce is based on the number of units I expect to sell. So you see how it all rolls up, right? So let's figure out what is my budgeted cost per unit. I know what my direct material is per unit. I know what my direct labor is per unit. I know what my factory overhead is per unit. Now, of course, I can allocate fixed factory overhead per unit. So let's add all those things together to get our total cost per unit, total budgeted cost per unit. Direct materials, half a pound of materials uh, per hockey stick times uh, $20 per pound of, of materials is $10 of direct materials per unit. Direct labor, 25 minutes at $12 per hour is $3.00 of direct labor per unit. Variable factory overhead is predetermined, $2.50 per unit. Fixed factory overhead. My total fixed factory overhead is $4,500 for those three units. I divide that by the total number of units I expect to produce for those three months. Gets me a dollar fifty cents of fixed factory overhead per unit. So, I take direct materials plus direct labor plus variable factory overhead plus fixed factory overhead equals a total product cost per unit of seventeen dollars. Everyone sees how we got there. I'm not big in the, uh, you know, hockey sticks. But you see how we got there? <laughs> yeah, good? Yes, Professor. Awesome, thank you. Great, 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 thank you. All right. Now, the total cost of goods sold. Cost of goods sold, as you know, uh, is the cost per unit. When it's sold, we expect to sell a certain am amount of units per month or per year. So we can figure out what is our estimated cost of goods sold per month or per year. That's easy. You take your sales units, the number of units you expect to sell, times 
the production cost per unit, 17 bucks in this example, equals the budgeted cost of goods sold. So number of units I expect to sell times the cost per unit equals your budgeted cost of goods sold. That makes sense. It's easy. So now we'll, we're putting it all together. Our sales budget drives everything. It drives our production budget. It drives our cost of goods sold budget. It drives our selling and administrative expenses budget. Selling and administrative expenses, as you know, are directly related to sales. My sales budget includes things like sales commissions, sales salaries, um, advertising expense, marketing expenses, right? All of those things are related to sales, so they're part of our sales expenses. In our company, we uh, apparently we sell hockey sticks, and we expect to pay uh, a sales commission equal to 10% of the total sales. And we also expect to pay our sale, sales managers a salary of $2,000. This information will help us to prepare the, sell, the sales expense budget. Month of October, expect to sell $60,000 worth hockey sticks if I give 10% commission on the total sales that means my sales commissions will be six thousand dollars for the month of October I have a manager he makes two thousand a month it gives me total selling expenses for the month of October eight thousand sales times the commission rate equals the sales commissions total plus the fixed Expense of the uh, salary for the manager equals the se total selling expenses. I do that for every month. What about the other expenses? General and administrative expenses. Of course, based off of the sales budget, but does not include sales expenses or manufacturing expenses because those have their own budgets. <laughs> but our general administrative, we have salaries of our other employees. This would be like the general manager, uh, the, the human resources, the accounting, etc. General selling administrative, I'm sorry, general and administrative expenses estimated it for the year it's $54,000. So you take your total general administrative expenses divided by 12, get you your selling administrative expenses per month. In this case, $4,500 per month. So total divided by 12 gives you your monthly. And it's just straight across per month, per month, per month, total. Okay. And then, as you know, the sales budget also drives this thing called the capital expenditures budget. Tells me more about my property, plant, and equipment that I expect to either purchase or sell or dispose of. Uh, this information uh, helps me to purchase property, plant, and equipment or to sell property, plant, and equipment. Uh, capital expenditures, as you know, directly relates to property, plant, and equipment or extraordinary repairs. Uh, and so this budget is separate from other expenses. There's not really much to it. It's, you know, if, if a piece of machinery costs 25,000 bucks, 
you plan to acquire that in the future based off of your sales. Ultimately, it really comes from net sales. That one's real easy. <laughs> and then, last but not least, we have our cash budget. The cash, the physical cash. The, think of your um, statement of cash flows. You've got operating, uh, operating activities, investing activities, and financing activities. Your operating activities, that's your day-to-day -day operations, your investing activities, that's purchase, sale, property, plant, equipment, and your financing activities would be things like taking out a loan, issuing stocks and bonds, etc. All of those things, they're also budgeted. It's important to understand when you expect to receive cash from your customers and when you expect to pay cash for your expenses. You have a beginning balance plus the estimated amount of cash you expect to receive from your customers minus the uh, payments you expect to make throughout the year equals your, uh, per, your cash balance that you expect to have. If the cash balance that you expect to have at the end of the year is adequate, you can continue to repay loans, is, uh, buy securities, issue dividends, etc. If you think you will not have enough cash on hand at the end of the year, you might need to take out a short-term loan. That's the very general formula for a cash budget. It's very straightforward. Yes, of course, it gets more detailed than that, but, uh, you know, that's the general budget for cash. It's That's the formula that I would use. You know, if this were an advanced accounting class, I would go through each part of that, but you don't have to worry too much about it. I do want you to understand where the cash comes from. Now, as you know, when we're selling products, Sometimes our customers don't pay us right away. They might pay us on, you know, through accounts receivable. Some will pay in cash. The others will pay in accounts receivable. You can estimate those things. Uh, for this company, the estimate was 40% paid us in cash in the past and 60% paid us uh, through accounts receivable in the past. So those are the percentages that we'll use for the future. 40% of our customers pay us in cash up front. 60% of us, of our customers will pay us through accounts receivable. As you recall, accounts receivable is when the customer purchases the product from you, but has not yet paid you. They'll pay you in a month from, from then, from the point of the sale. Hopefully. <laughs> Otherwise, you got to chase them down. So here's how that works. We can Here's how we estimate going forward for each month. So 60% of your customers are, are going to pay you an accounts receivable. So, so September, I sold $42,000 worth of stuff. 60% of them are going to pay me uh, the next month. So that's $25,200 in the month of October. In October, I sold $60,000. 60% of that is going to pay me next month. That's my accounts receivable. So $36,000 goes to next month. The rest pay me in cash, 40% in cash, so $24,000. How do I get $24,000? $60,000 times 0.4 is the 40%, so that's uh, $24,000, plus the accounts receivable from the previous month. 25,200 gives me a total cash receipts for the month of October of 49,200. And you see how we do that each month. So just, you know, just like any other accounts receivable, accounts receivables typically do 30 days pay, uh, uh, beyond the point of purchase. So if I purchase it in September, I'm going to have to pay them in October. That's how it works. doesn't always work that way, but it's, it's a pretty good average, especially for a company that sells something like hockey sticks.
Uh, cash budgeting, very important. Why? We need to know how much, how much to expect that we're going to receive from our customers in order to budget how much I need to pay for direct materials, direct labor, factory overhead. That's why budgeting cash is very important. Uh, for purchasing materials, I can base it off of my cash receipts that I expect to make to have, and that's kind of what that shows us. Very straightforward. Preparing for the cash budget, we take the beginning cash balance at the beginning of the year plus the estimated amount of cash I expect to receive from my customers minus the uh, amount of cash I expect to pay for my expenses equals my uh, cash balance that I expect to end with. If it's good uh, amount, if it's a positive amount, I can repay loans, buy securities, make other investments. Uh, if it's not enough cash at the end of the, uh, of the year, I would expect I might need to take out a short-term loan. Uh, and so, of course, there's always going to be some extra things that will happen throughout the year. Uh, income taxes, uh, purchase some equipment, a loan, um, so forth and so on. So all of these things ultimately are planned through the cash budget. Uh, some of it's not. And so for those, some of the stuff that's not, we would uh, classify as an expense. So in Pavle's earlier example, if, if let's say Pavle plans to sell four cars, one of those cars has an extraordinary repair. Let's say, uh, you know, needs a new transmission, we'll say. And when when Pavle goes to sell that fourth car and it needs a new transmission, there's going to be added cost to that uh, cost of goods sold for that car. When that happens, ultimately, he would want to sell that car at a higher price. If that's not possible, then that expense, that, that cost of goods sold will show as a negative for that particular sale. So you would actually lose on that uh, uh, on that sale. Uh, and, and what he would have to carry that loss forward into the next month. It's ultimately what would happen. Uh, and this is this is a total uh, version of a cash budget. We see our beginning balance plus what we expect to receive from our customers gives me total cash available minus all of my expenses for direct labor, direct material, factory overhead, sales commission, sales salaries, general administrative expenses, uh, income taxes, dividends, loans, uh, gives me my total cash payments. So total cash available minus total cash payments equals my ending balance of cash for each month. And then any additional activity uh, give me my total ending balance. That's a cash budget. Come on. Probably there's a lot of these pop-up things. Okay, here we go. So, all of this to say, once your cash budget is complete, you can accurately budget your income statement. We already know what our sales are going to be, so your revenue is already budgeted. Then you can go ahead and try to predict your expenses. For each month and you could budget for those so as you know on any income statement you got your sales minus cost of goods sold equals gross profit minus your exp uh, operating expenses um, equals income before income tax minus your income tax it gets you net income 
So we can budget for all of those things based off of our expected cash, especially when it comes to the income taxes. <laughs> we can also budget our balance sheet. The balance sheet, as you know, shows the company's assets, liabilities, and equity. We can we already know what the cash budget's going to be because we went through the cash budgeting process. We can also we also know what our accounts receivable budget's going to be because we went through our sales budget. We know what our uh, raw materials and finished goods is going to be because we went through our uh, production budget. We know what our equipment is and appreciation is going to be because we went through the budget for our uh, capital expenses. So forth and so on. You see where I'm going. Once you go through the process of budgeting, sales budget drives the production budget, drives the cash budget. Sales budget also drives selling general expenses. Sales budget also drives the capital expenditures. All of those drive the cash budget. You see, once you go through the steps, budget for sales, budget for production, budget for selling administrative expenses, budget for capital expenses, then budget for cash, we can see once you've done all those things, then you can, uh, of course, plan for your income statement and balance sheet to be fully budgeted. That's the beauty of the master budget. And the master budget, as time marches forward, we compare our actual performance to our budgeted performance. Uh, some budgets are based off of activities rather, uh, rather than uh, traditional items. Activities would be things like auditing, tax prepare, financial reporting, cost accounting for an accounting department. For a production department, the activities would be things like woodcutting department, assembly department, painting department, activities. It's just like when we talked about uh, activity-based costing. Works the same exact way, but you can budget based off of activities as well. What about for a merchandise business? Works the same way. So Pavle, he's in the business of buying and selling cars. So since he's in the business of buying and selling cars, instead of there being a production budget, because he's not making the cars, the cars are already made. He's just selling them. He would have, instead of him having a, a production budget, he would have a purchasing budget. That would be the primary difference here when you're selling in inventory that's already made. So what about that inventory budget? How is that, how is that done? So let's say, uh, you know, Pav, Pavle, he, he's going to buy, so he plans on buying a couple of cars and selling a couple of cars. And he needs to know how many cars does he need to purchase uh, th for the year. Well, here's how he does it. He looks at his ending inventory. How many cars does he have available currently? Plus, he adds in the sales um. for the period. How many cars th uh, did he sell during the period? Then he subtracts out uh, what he wants to end the period with. How many cars does he want left on hand at the end of the year? So his current ending balance plus purchases that he expects to sell minus what he wants to end the year with. That will tell him how many cars he needs to purchase. And he can do that, you know, really with anything. But that, that's just one example.
Of course, in the hockey stick business uh, that we still got going on, this one's a retailer. Uh, sales times future sales equals budget, I think inventory plus purchases uh, minus and desired ending inventory equals the number of units you need to purchase for the month. Sales price, or I'm sorry, cost times the number of units you expect to purchase equals the total budget cost for merchandise purchases. But it really works, it, you know, it works pretty much the same exact way as it did with the production budget. The difference here is that instead of producing it, we're just we're just buying the inventory that already exists. So it's, it's really a little easier in my opinion. But. Okay. So, my friends, uh, we have made it to the end of the master budget and planning. I am going to stop the recording now. Would you all like to take a short break or would you like to uh, 